Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please stand with me for our first song of praise, Sean Jesus Shop. Jesus and a fisherman. He was like, come on, I'm calling you to be a fisher's man. And 
is truth. Mm-hmm. And when you're able to just share that truth with people, it literally gives them hope.
Please turn with me now over to hymn 328, and we'll sing all three verses of the wonderful grace of Jesus. <clears throat>
Today's question is, what is the origin of Fat Tuesday or Mardi Gras? In this video, I'll answer that question from a biblical perspective. Then afterwards, as always, I'll share some helpful resources, so stick around to the end. Mardi Gras, which is French for Fat Tuesday, is the last day of a season called Carnival. The Carnival season is characterized by merrymaking, feasting, and dancing. Mardi Gras is the culmination of festivities and features parades, masquerades, and unfortunately, often drunkenness and shameless debauchery. Carnival is typically celebrated in the Catholic countries of Southern Europe and Latin America. The excess of Carnival may not seem to have much in common with the austerity of Lent, but the two seasons are inseparable. The day after Fat Tuesday is Ash Wednesday. Therefore, the end of Carnival is followed immediately by the beginning of Lent. Lent is a time of fasting and penance in preparation for Easter. Carnival, then, can rightly be seen as the indulgence before the fast. It is the last binge before having to give up something for 40 days. What does the Bible say about all this? There is nothing in the Bible that in any way suggests that early Christians observed either Lent or Carnival. And of course, there is no biblical support for the kind of fleshly indulgence generally practiced on Fat Tuesday. The Bible expressly forbids drunkenness, carousing, and sexual fornication. Romans chapter 13, verses 13 through 14 says, Let us behave decently, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. In general, Mardi Gras revelers engage in a binge of sinning for a time of consecration to God. The celebration of Mardi Gras fosters the notion that you can do whatever you want on Fat Tuesday as long as you show up to church on Ash Wednesday. It's the bender before the benediction, and it's utterly unscriptural. Want to learn more? Subscribe so you don't miss the next video. Visit GodQuestions.org for more great content. And check out the details section below this video. There's more book I recommend on our several related questions. If you'd like to learn about Bible Lunch, or if you're interested in bite-sized devotionals, subscribe to Bible Lunch on YouTube. It's linked right here. Now remember, if you got questions, the Bible has answers. We'll hope you find them. Good to see everyone. Glad you're here. Take your bulletin inserts out, if you will. Uh, make a few notes by say something that uh, strikes you or you think is worth remembering, or something that uh, I provoke you to think about. I have a tendency to provoke people sometimes. Uh, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. Did we, uh, ta uh, did we take this from uh, Scott? Or did uh, we buy our own here? We bought. We bought our own. Good. Okay. Well, we had this handy dandy microphone with uh, our singing group last week, and it, it worked so well that uh, we went out and got one. So praise the Lord. Now there is a bulletin typo. Some of you missed it. Some of you saw it. And uh, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. In the bulletin insert, you will see that the reference is for Joel 12. Now, I, I could have been mean and said, how many of you read the scripture this week? And then said, liar, liar, pants on fire. But I decided not to do that. Uh, and it's not John's fault, and it's not Judy's fault. It's my fault. I was, uh, the actual scripture, you see it on the screen, Joel 2. There are only four chapters in Joel. So if you'd have told me you read it, Three chapters in Joel. So if you if you uh, told me you'd read chapter 12, I'd, I'd know you were uh, funny me. But it's a short, it's one of the minor prophets, that is, it's a short work. And it's stuck there between uh, uh, Hosea and Amos. And so a lot of people, uh, it, it'd be very easy to miss it. But there are some interesting scriptures here that I want to call to your attention this morning. Happy to have uh, uh, the, the Steens here with us, uh, the uh, director of missions for uh, our group. He, he spoke here a few weeks ago. I'm happy to have him back again. Joel chapter 2, verse 12. I'm going to put it on the screen if you uh, uh, don't uh, look it up in, in the scripture. This is God's call to Israel for repentance. Starting in verse 12. Even now, 
This is the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love. And he relents from sending disaster. Now this is a repetition because I did the PowerPoint, not Judy, but it's worth repeating. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him so that you can offer grain and wine to the Lord your God. You know, in the Old Testament, when it talks about blessings, one of the blessings is removing problems from our lives. Now, just because we have problems doesn't mean we're not right with God. Sometimes it's part of the maturing process. But it's up to us to analyze why we're going through what we're going through and if it's a result of something we did or didn't do. Uh, for those of you that went through the Financial Peace Course, uh, one of the times we offered it, many times people find themselves in financial difficulties because of their own lazy habits. They don't set money aside for emergencies. They spend money they don't need to spend on things that are frivolous. And then they find themselves in a pinch. Again, just because somebody is in a financial pinch does not mean that God is punishing them. But it also could mean that they're foolish with the money that God has entrusted to them. So it's up to us as individuals when we find ourselves in a problem, in a situation, that we look to God and say, Lord, did I do something stupid that is not on my radar? Is there something I should confess? Is there something I should stop doing that I that I am doing? Is there something I should start doing that I'm not doing? Who knows? If it is a problem and you are causing it, he may turn. He may relent. And he may leave a blessing behind him so that you can offer grain and wine to the Lord your God. Let's pray before we get started. Now, Lord, we are so thankful for your word. We're so thankful for the clarity of your word. And we just hope that we help, help us to take it to our lives, to realize what you want us to do, why you have left us here in this world. And we pray that we will be obedient to your command. In your name we ask. Amen. Now, the title of today's uh, sermon is on a movie that I have never seen, and I have no intention of ever seeing it. Sorry, but when I hear people who have little girls, and this is all they can say is, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. And I thought it was a good topic. But when I, when I think of let it go, this is what I think of. I think of Rambo. <laughs> let it go! I think of Batman. And I think of this guy. What if I just told you it's time to let it go? Well, you know, there are some things in our lives, habits that we have, that we need to let go. Right now we're looking at Lent, and as Baptists, we don't celebrate Lent as much as some others, and we'll get into that in a minute. But it is a good time of reflection. This is the time that Jesus entered into the 40 days of fasting in the temptation. And so the 40 days before Easter is a good time for us to reflect, for us to look at our lives and perhaps let some things go. Fasting or giving something up for Lent it is mostly a Catholic custom, but some Protestants and some not even non-believers take part. Of the religious groups most likely to observe Lent, a Roman Catholic, 61%, according to a Lifeway survey. For those of you that don't know, Lifeway is an arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. 
And so many, although they are primarily Southern Baptist, they do sell to all religious organizations. That's a big part of the outreach. And believe it or not, there are many non-Baptist groups that use Lifeway, the same Sunday school materials uh, we use. Uh, so Catholic 61%, uh, Protestants, and even those with evangelical beliefs of different stripes, 20 and 28%. So it's, it's a fairly broad spectrum. In general, 43% of people who attend a church at least once a month will do something for Lent. Now, Ash Wednesday, if you have uh, uh, Catholic friends or family, you know that uh, many will go on Ash Wednesday and they'll have the uh, ashes put on their forehead. And there is no biblical basis for that specific verse, but there's no prohibition to it. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. There, there are those that do it faithfully, and you know what? They take a stand for their faith because there are those, and I have seen people in the workplace mocked for doing something that is a deep part of their religious heritage. And I don't think that is ever right to mock someone's religious heritage. Now, there used to be a day at a time when we could civilly talk about differences and traditions. I think in most of America, that is still the case. It's our faith tradition to do something this way. It's their faith tradition to do something that way. And agree to disagree. Unfortunately, there is a segment, a noisy segment of our society that uh, I heard this from uh, Charlie Tremendous Jones, and I just, I just love the saying. He said, and you will run into people that if you don't think like they think, they think you don't think. And sadly, that's the world we live in. And sadly, there are some times when you have to withdraw from groups of people. Now, there are some that will fast. They'll give something up for Lent. Nothing wrong with that. We see in Daniel chapter 10. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat, no wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. And so we see a biblical basis, but it's not a command that we have to do it for Lent. In 1962, Lou Groen, never heard of it. He owned a McDonald's franchise in Cincinnati, Ohio. And during Lent, his Friday sales were horrible. But down at Big Boy, since they had a fish sandwich, they were just lined up outside the door. That's, so being an entrepreneur, he says, you know what? I'm going to put together a fish sandwich. Now, normally, uh, the big franchises uh, do not like that. But uh, and if I'm correct, the Big Mac was made by somebody other than headquarters that we see the fish fillet was, and uh, eventually that took it worldwide. In fact, I, I just found this out this week, that one of the most famous fans of the fillet, fish fillet lives at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. He talked to this about uh, at, a, at a town hall meeting. He told CNN's Anderson Cooper that his favorite menu item at McDonald's is the fish sandwich, which he called the fish delight. Found that fascinating. Eating fish on instead of meat on Friday, neither good nor bad. If your tradition is go, going to get ashes on Wednesday, I cannot tell you, and I will not tell you that it's good or bad. But I will tell you that on Ash Wednesday, the time of Lent beginning, it is a time to examine ourselves. Ash Wednesday is a time we should cut to the core of our existence. Because Super Bowl for Christians is coming up. Easter is the major holiday of the Christian community. 
during Lent. We are not what we eat or don't eat. We are not what we do. We're not what we fear. We are human beings created in the image of God. But we have a habit of accumulating complexities that we don't necessarily need or are good for us. A couple of you uh, uh, had the conversation about no, no, two years, maybe three years back, uh, Dunkin' Donut came up with a red velvet coffee and a red <coughs> velvet donut. And I am so thankful they stopped making that because that was a bad habit for me. That was just almost irresistible for me. And so there comes a time in our lives when we have to say, you know what, I'm not going to do this anymore. Easter brings <coughs> new beginnings. And so, as Christians, during Lent, we should undergo a process of letting things go that are not good for our testimony, that are not good for us physically, and they're not good for our minds. I encourage you to spend time the next 40 days with scripture readings, with meditations, with prayer, and with God. Ramp it up a little bit. Allow God to speak and show you what, if anything, you need to let go of or you need to add to your life. You might even decide to give something up, a fast. You can choose one activity, one luxury, or one item that will require effort on your part to give it up during this time. Don't simply give it up, but use it differently. For, for example, you may choose to fast for 30 minutes of sleep. That is, get up a half an hour early. Give up that sleep that you'd love to have and use it in prayer, meditation, and Bible study. Taking extra time to pray for people who need our prayers. You may choose to drink water for your lunch instead of that expensive soda and set that money aside for a special cause or to bless someone's life. I'm listening to uh, Dave Ramsey, and he talks about blessing someone, and a guy called, he said, I'm so frustrated, Dave, I'm so frustrated. I said, why are you frustrated? He said, I've got this $50 bill in my wallet. And he says, I have, I have said that any time a waitress or any kind of service worker, anyone that is serving me in any way, the pizza delivery person, he said, if the pizza per delivery person comes to my door and I say, how you doing? And they say, better than I deserve. I know they're trying to get out of debt. I know they're on your plan. And I've got a $50 bill. And he says, I'm so frustrated because I've been carrying that around in my wallet. <coughs> and no one has come and said, better than I deserve. I submit to you that God might have already answered a prayer. There, there were times that $50 would have been a big deal in my life. It's not a little deal now, don't get me wrong. But I, I, again, I've said it often, there are times that Judy and I, if it only cost 50 cents to go around the world, we couldn't get out of sight. But there's somebody out there that $50 could <coughs> radically change their world. And so, if you want to set aside, give up a luxury, and set that money aside so that when that opportunity comes, you can bless that person. That is an honorable thing. Ash Wednesday starts at midnight on this Wednesday. Tuesday, Mardi Gras. If you've never been down there for it, uh, it's probably better that you don't. It's a good place to avoid from what I hear. And there's all kinds of partying and all kinds of things going on on Fat Tuesday. But as we start to think about this week, we need to start to dedicate ourselves to the Lord. Now, being a Christian is both easy and it's hard. It's easy because the Lord did all the work. He made the sacrifice. All we have to do is accept it. That's the easy part. The hard part is living the life. You know, I, I heard it said that, uh, you know, the Old Testament talks about a living sacrifice. The New Testament talks about a living sacrifice. The problem with a living sacrifice, it keeps crawling down off the altar. 
I mean, a, a dead sacrifice is a sacrifice, but we are living sacrifices, and we have the ability to keep crawling down off the altar. And so it's a constant battle keeping with the Lord and doing the things we should. But let's look at three things quickly that we need to let go of. We need to get out of. And the first one is you need, we need to let go of our bad relationships. The scripture says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Any of us that are parents, we can spot the bad kid in the neighborhood very quickly. And our, our kids many sometimes couldn't see it. Uh, we don't want you hanging around with those kids. And many times teenagers can't see it. But as parents, you have an eye for it. We try to have a positive peer pressure for our children. And we should try to have a positive peer pressure for ourselves. That's why we have our ladies small group. That's why we have our men's Bible study. So we have an opportunity to get together under proper circumstances, under good conditions that we can enjoy each other, but we can do it within the bounds of Christianity. As a Christian, we have to be careful who we associate with because most of the times, the people we associate with can and do have a uh, influence in our lives. As a Christian, we, just, we need to spend more time with Christians. That's what the church is for. That's why we're here. Because the chances of every one of us being 100% every week is just not going to happen. But the time that I'm up, I can help somebody that's down. The time that I'm down, you can help me get my attitude back up. That's why we are here as a church. The book of Proverbs, like all biblical writings, is God's word to his people. God gave us the book in a form of a dad speaking to his young son. That dad warned the son of the corruption and the damage that comes in some common ways. And one of those ways that damage comes is by running with the wrong crowd. He said in Proverbs 1.15, my son, walk, now, walk not thou in the way of them. Refrain thy foot from their path. Don't walk with, don't travel through life with corrupt companions. The wrong kind of friends will lead you to do things that you would have never done had you not joined in with the wrong crowd. Pastor Duke, if you follow him, you'll see that a lot of uh, most Sunday nights he spends in jail. Uh, not as a guest, but he goes there to preach. And uh, he said he's never seen a more receptive group of people and the stories he could tell of bad company and being corrupted and making a poor decision by people who are will be incarcerated much if not the rest of their lives we need to let go of our bad relationships the problem with bad friends is they are evil companions as God sees it and he sees best and he sees accurately. Learn a truth. The wrong kind of friends are those who entice you to do things that violate your conscience that you would not have done on your own. Some wrong things might do is, is all on that person. People do stupid things. But sometimes we're in a place where we allow ourselves to be influenced. In the case in this verse, it refers to a person being drawn in to do things that move that person away from walking closely with Jesus Christ and his purposes. We need to let go of our bad relationships. The second thing, we need to let go of the world. We need to let go of the world. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. That's Romans chapter 12, verse 2. The Bible says we should not be conformed to the standards of this world, but be transformed 
by the renewing of our minds. As Christians, we might live in the world, but we are not of this world. We are pilgrims. We are traveling through. Our home is in heaven. We are citizens of heaven and ambassadors of the kingdom of God. But in too many, time, too many times in national surveys that are taken, Christians and unbelievers track very closely in areas of divorce, financial instability, lifestyle-related health problems, and other areas. Here are some listed in the message. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, brutal tempers, and impotence to love or be loved. Divided homes, divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits. The vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Uncontrolled and uncontrollable uh, addictions. Ugly parodies of community. I could go on. Yikes. See, a boat does not sink because it is in and surrounded by water. The boat starts to sink when the water gets into the boat. And that's the way it is in our lives. We are in the world, we are not of the world. And if too much of the world gets into us, our Christian testimony will sink. We are ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20 in the CEV. We were sent to speak for Christ, and God is begging you to listen to our message. We speak for Christ and sincerely ask you to make peace for God. When someone from our State Department goes to North Korea or goes to Iraq, they are representing, they are representing the United States of America. And the State Department say, we plead with you. We plead with you not to do the things you're doing. We plead with you not to take an action against us. That kind of thing is going on all the time. When we represent the gospel to our friends, our neighbors, our relatives, those around us, we are representing heaven. You are the only Bible some people will ever read. I know that's a frightening thought. But you and I are the only Bible that some people will ever read. The world and the systems of the world are governed by different principles and values. And in this day and age, we're starting to see that in our cities and our legislative bodies, the consistency between uh, breaking the law and punishment is it's amazing one person will be punished for something else that someone is celebrated for when this country was founded it was supposed to be justice is blind and everyone has the same scale remember lady lady uh, justice where she has the scale and she's got a blindfold on doesn't matter who's standing before her one law for everybody. It is not that way in practice, my friends. It is not that way in practice. But here's the thing. You know, we're supposed to be careful the people we hang around with and the bad influence they might have on us. Jesus hung around with thieves, adulterers, prostitutes. Here's the key. He had an impact on them. They did not have an impact on him. He showed them the right way. He did not follow their wrong way. They conformed to him. He did not conform to them. We need to let go of the world. And the third thing, we need to let go of the works 
of the flesh. We need to let go of the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery. Now this is the same verse that I read a few minutes ago out of the message. It's, it's in the uh, uh, CEV today. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, anything similar. I am warning you about these things, as I warned you before, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Scary stuff. Back in the 50s, there was a TV program called Father's Father Knows Best. And it, it, it tried to communicate wholesome family values that were in the 50s, but it was about the ideal family, the perfect family, and we don't live in a perfect world. In some ways, they held up an unattainable standard that no family could ever meet. Father Knows Best might have gone a little over the top portraying what was real in American household. But as a Christ follower, I really do believe that our Heavenly Father does know best. That's why it's wise to listen to what He has to say. Question for you today, do you really believe your Heavenly Father knows what's best for you? Now, all of us are going through something, some more severe than others. But I have to have the faith and belief that my Heavenly Father knows what's best for me, and He has a plan for me, and He may not have revealed it all yet, but He is in control. Some people have their doubts because they have a hard time trusting God completely. Satan has been trying to get people to question God right from the beginning. Remember how he sowed the seeds of doubt in the uh, Garden of Eden? Did God really say don't eat from all the trees of that tree? See, that question caused them to second guess what God had said. Today it seems like people doubt or question what God has to say about sexuality, about morality, about a lot of different topics. Doesn't God want me to be happy? God wants more than anything else to be happy. And again, those of us that are parents have a different insight, especially the day after Halloween. Don't you want me to be happy, Mommy, and eat all those candy bars? Yeah, well, I know that's going to be very short-lived there, Junior. And so we have to step in sometimes. Just as we are willing to step in and take the lumps from our kids. God has a plan for us, and God is not going to give us the answer every time that we want to hear. He'll give us the answer we need to hear, but not necessarily the answer we want to hear. It's easy to blame the devil for everything. The drunk blames the drink. The pedophile blames the child. The drug addict blames the drug. The control-hungry bureaucrat blames the gun or the knife or the tool. The overweight person blames the fork. The failing student blames the pencil. But sometimes it's really us that's the mind. Sometimes it's really our flesh that is at fault. Because we can become victims of our own desires. Talking with someone this morning, and he, he was saying that uh, and he, he ate some stuff yesterday that probably shouldn't have eaten, and he said he felt horrible ever since. And you know what? We've all done that. Not too many of us uh, that, that watched the Super Bowl Sunday evening felt a hundred percent because uh, we overindulge. But there are things that are much more serious than just overindulging in the wrong kind of food. And, uh, years gone past, the AIDS epidemic, AIDS epidemic was a perfect example of that. So many people fall for the deception that leads to a life 
of sin later on. Anytime we try and second guess God, we are vulnerable to the enemy's lies. And that's why it's so important to stay rooted in God's word. We're often deceived because we're blinded to the truth. God's word provides a standard of truth that is unchanging and eternal. God's word is like a compass that is always pointing to true north. And just because the scenery over here looks good, or the scenery over there looks good, or it may look like an easier way, if true north is this way, for the Christian, we need to be following God's word. And even if it looks like the path is going to be more difficult, that's where God wants us to be. So this week, especially with Ash Wednesday, time of reflection, time of self-analysis, and ask the Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do different, if anything? So that's between you and the Lord. I'm not going to tell you you should do this or should do that, other than what the scripture, scriptural, uh, scripture plainly points out. Most of the time, you know what God wants you to do, and you just haven't been willing to do it. So I challenge you this week, pray about it. Lord, give me the strength, give me the courage, give me the conviction to do the thing that you want me to do. We're going to have the praise team come. We're going to have... Uh, time of invitation. If you need to do business with God, this is the time to do it. If you need to come forward and talk with a, a Christian counselor, that is fine. We'll, we will have somebody here for you. If you just need to, in your seat to say, Lord, I know what you want me to do, and Lord, help me to do it. This is the time. To do it. Let's all stand together for a word of prayer as the praise team comes. Now, Lord, we pray that you would take these words and take this time of year of reflection, of us knowing what you went through several thousand years ago. That before you started your public ministry, you were tempted by Satan, just as we are tempted by Satan. And then the time before your crucifixion and the ultimate sacrifice that you gave for us. Lord, we pray if there's one here that has not accepted you as their personal Savior, that this would be the day. We pray if there's one here who has accepted you as their Savior, but they've not taken that first step of obedience into baptism, that this would be the day. And Lord, we just pray that that secret sin that's in our lives, that we would give that back to you. We pray that you'd be with us throughout the remainder of the service. Amen. Please remain standing. <clears throat>
have anything that you'd like to add from the association? Just praise the Lord for the opportunity to be here with you all today. <clears throat> We've got a, a prayer breakfast coming up, a Mid Maryland Prayer Breakfast, March 4th. And uh, Don Whitney is a tremendous speaker. And I encourage any of you who can get out for that prayer breakfast, you will be blessed. He's going to be pre uh, speaking on the topic of uh, praying the Bible. And uh, if any of you have difficulties with your prayer life, and I know for myself, I would like my Everybody prayer life to be better. <laughs> you know? uh, I think Don Whitney can uh, uh, give you some, uh, some uh, help in that area of your life. Uh, he's written a book on that topic and on spiritual disciplines, which has transformed the lives of a lot of Christians. Amen. So it's Wednesday the 4th, what time? Uh, it's Saturday the 4th. Oh. It's 8 o'clock in the morning. I'm sorry. The March 14th. 14th, March okay. 14th. I know the 5th is Thursday. I know that was yeah. Jerry, everyone. Because I was going to say, well, Jerry, you can't go to it. You can't eat that morning. Yeah. Yeah. March 14th. March 14th. March 14th. We'll publish it in the morning. Okay, okay, we'll get the information out. Thank you for that. Are there any other announcements? Norman? So it's fire next Sunday, and it's okay we would like to stay the next Sunday. The Choir next Sunday. Uh, one of our own, uh, Jacob Lipscomb, uh, yesterday uh, won the <coughs> county championship for his weight class in wrestling. Praise the Lord. Uh, the great, so he will be advancing to the state championships. Uh, for wrestling, uh, represent Baltimore County and Lansdowne Senior High School. Go Viking, I'm an alumni. Uh, <laughs> but that's quite an accomplishment. Uh, I know as of a couple of weeks ago, he had his, in his high school career of four years, he had over 100 wins uh, in wrestling. So in his high school career, so that's quite an accomplishment. So uh, a shame they're not here today to hear the praise, but if they're watching on the video, <laughs> congratulations, Dave. Any other announcements? If there are none, please stand and rise. Let us close our service. <laughs> Thank you.